Wait, there we go. Okay. Okay, there you go. okay. So the Lord was speaking to me as we were worshiping um, something totally unexpected, but we need to do this as a body of Christ because our brothers and sisters in Israel need us, as does their leader, Benjamin Netanyahu. And so we're going to do this Psalm 83. And in my Bible, it says this is a prayer to frustrate conspiracy against Israel. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyr, Assyria has also joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns the woods and as the flame sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that word. And we lift up our brothers and sisters in Israel, and we thank you for a high hedge of protection around them and a ring of fire. Well, today's message is... Uh, definitely heaven sent and um i'll tell you the name of it in a minute but first of all um as i was praying about what i should share with um with my friends my family members um the lord spoke and he said tell them about my glory tell them i love them my glory is mine alone to give it is my essence my holiness and he, he titled the message, My Glory, My Way. And I'll tell you a little story about that in a little bit. But My Glory, My Way. Yes, Lord. Um, in, in Hebrew, the word glory is kavad. And um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, as Alexandra, who is our Messianic Jew here. But kavad is spelled K-A-V-O-D. It appears in uh, 200 times in the Bible, and the root meaning is heaviness. So you heard pastors speak about it's heavy up here. It's heavy, and I feel it too. Um, so it's a weightiness. Um, and this can be seen in the Bible when Moses is referring, um, when his hands were heavy in Exodus 17, 12, his hands were so heavy that uh, Aaron and Hur had to hold them up because they were fighting a battle, and every time Moses hands went down, Israel started losing the battle. When his hands were raised, Israel was, was winning the battle, and they did win the battle. The glory is also referred to as the Shekinah. The verb shechan, S-H-A-C-H-A-N, is found in the Bible and means to settle, inhabit, or dwell. It is a continual dwelling in the midst of the people. So now we're going to read one of the most intimate encounters between man and God ever recorded. And this is in Exodus 33, 15 through 23. And um, again, if you'd like to go there, um, this is gonna be our foundational scriptural, scripture for today. 
This is occurring as the Lord commands Moses to leave Sinai. And this is just after Aaron um, and the people of Israel have sinned with the golden calf. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. Verse 17 in Exodus, Exodus 33 says, So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, Please show me your glory. Then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But God said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses wanted an intimate knowledge of God himself. His request was not just to know his acts or feel his presence, his power, but to encounter his very being. This pleased God and Moses found favor in his sight. God said Moses knew him by name. This is so important that we worship God for who he is. Our creator, not worshiping mother nature. No, we worship the creator of nature. And names to God are so important. We, we know throughout the Bible that God actually changes names of people. He changed Abram to Abraham. He changed Simon to Peter. And um, we know that we're called a friend of God. Well, what is God's name? We find it in Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He's all-knowing, he's all-present, he's omnipotent, unlimited power, unlimited authority. He's always existing, the Alpha, and the, the Alpha and the Omega, which is the beginning and end of the Greek alphabet, but there's no beginning to God. He just always was. He always was and he always is. In verse 19 of Exodus 33, he says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and have compassion on whom I have compassion. In other words, God is sovereign. When his glory falls, he moves according to his will, not man's. According to Romans 8:15, he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and compassion on whomever he will have compassion. So that's New Testament. We learned in Old Testament, New Testament, they both speak the same thing. So in the glory, his very essence causes things to happen by his supreme power and authority. In verse 21 of Exodus 33, he says, So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand while I pass by. Here we get a glimpse of how big God really is that his hand can cover all of Moses. God Almighty chose to partially reveal himself to a man who fully trusted him. And now Moses was experiencing the magnificence of his creator in a new way, an intimate, wonderful way to know God and experience the fullness of his person. So what happens after this encounter? After this amazing glory encounter that Moses has, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments the second time. Because remember the first time, Moses sent him, sent him down after the people sinned. God also describes himself in Exodus 34, the very next verse, as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, 
keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and sin and transgression of sin, by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So just this verse alone shows us that what we do today affects our children and future generations. Amen. Keeping our sin not only weighs heavily on us, but to those who come after us. That's why you may feel the weight or the heavy conviction of sin on your heart when you don't repent or turn away from sin. In Exodus, we also see how God's glory lifts, ascends, and descends in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So you may see a mist or a cloud appear when his glory comes. I have heard of uh, people actually seeing a mist, a cloud in certain sanctuaries where his glory comes in. We also see how God cautions us, prepares us before his glory manifests. It is not to be taken lightly or trivial. In your Bible, do you remember reading how when the Ark of the Covenant was being taken, trans was being transported on an ox cart, and a man named Uzzah reached out to steady it, he fell dead. This is in 1 Chronicles 13, 9 and 10. So we can see that there's a certain protocol. There's a certain way to handle the glory. And he won't accept anything less. And that's why just a few weeks ago, God spoke from this pulpit and said, if you have sin, basically, don't step in right now. Don't step into that glory at the moment. He always wants us to repent of sin, but we must remember there is a protocol when his glory happens. His glory is all about holiness. God dictates how we are to be in his glory. Leviticus 10, 3. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. He gets all the praise. He gets all the honor. We exalt him. One of the most poignant ways I saw in the modern world how people can honor God is from a little four-year-old boy named Colton Burpo. And you may remember a beautiful movie called The Boy Who Went to Heaven. Well, Colton was very sick. He was in the hospital. And his parents were praying. His dad was a minister and was praying in, in the uh, chapel. Didn't know if his son was going to live or die. His son did live. And one day they were traveling in the car. And his son was in the back seat. And he was singing. The little boy was singing in the back car. And then he said, oh, dad, I was sat on Jesus' lap. And the minister turned around and he said, What? You, you were with Jesus? And the boy said, yes, yes, I was. Well, another conversation later, the minister started thinking about it. And he said, well, what did you do, Colton, when you saw Jesus? He said, oh, Dad, that was easy. This is what everybody does. And I'm going to demonstrate it. And that's what we're going to be doing because he is everything, the almighty God. Yeah. How many remember Pastor Linda saying, God, show us your glory, show up and show off and take all the credit. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's all about him. What happens in the glory? Look at 2 Chronicles 5, 13 and 14. This is when 120 priests and singers are entering Solomon's temple. They finally got the ark, and it's finally headed to the temple. And it, the verse reads, Indeed it came to pass when the trumpets and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. 
that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. God's glory, his presence descended when the people were unanimous in their praise song. They were of one accord like at Pentecost when his glory appeared as tongues of cloven fire. His glory filled the place and the result was the priests were unable to minister. In my Bible, it actually says they were thrown down. They had to cease their work for the Lord of the work was present. In Exodus, even Moses could not enter the tabernacle when God's glory filled it. Here we see that in his glory, we may not be able to move. It will be him doing as he wills. David is, as we all know, the man after God's own heart. He knew God and his glory in creation. In Psalm 8, he wrote, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made man a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. In this reference in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, it says God has actually crowned man with splendor. Mm -hmm. That's honor and glory. In spite of man's smallness to the vast heavens, how cool is that? You have more glory in you, more splendor in you than the moon and the stars. What dwells in you is glorious. When you have Jesus, knowing him as your Lord and Savior, you have God's glory. You are his living temple to do good in the world, to affect change for the better. David continues in Psalm 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The long Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. What I love about this psalm is how God's glory comes in when his people are in battle. We welcome his presence when we allow him in. When we get the gates open, when we put him first, honoring him for who he is. In other words, as I heard one preacher say, we are the doorkeepers that swing the doors and gates open. We open the gates of heaven, his light to others, and shut the gates of hell. Psalm 145, David tells us how to enter his glory. If you'd like, go there in your Bible at Psalm 145, verse 10. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. When we tell others of his kingdom, making others know his mighty acts by our testimony, we enter his glory, his presence, and in that moment, all can change. In his glory, addictions can cease. Depression and thoughts of suicide flee. And all his goodness, his holiness takes over. Do you see how David says he lifts up all who fall? and raises all who are bowed down. That's humility. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. O oh, church, get ready. 
For when his glory shows up, anything can happen. Psalm 145, 18 through 20. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all of who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. That's revere and honor him. He will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Just because you may not see his justice at the time you expect it, does not mean it won't happen. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So let go and let God take care of injustice. You stay in faith, stand in faith, and speak his word over what is happening in life and trust him. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. The mountain is your problem. Jesus gave us the key to speak the word of God. The kingdom of God is voice activated. Use your voice with his word and watch how he sovereignly moves for you. Proverbs 25, 2, Solomon, the wisest man on earth, says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. If we have righteous rulers, leaders, God will reveal what is hidden. He will reveal it in his glory. God's glory is his alone. Isaiah 42, 8 and 9. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former thing have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So here's another key. In the glory, he will declare new things. There will be prophecy of what is to come. His glory can rise upon you, his people. Isaiah 60, 1 and 2. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. There's a lot in this passage. We are to know that his light, his glory, will cover us, and will be visibly seen. Just like Moses' face shone when he came down the mountain from being in God's presence, that brilliant light will be so visible it will outshine the darkness. This passage speaks of a time to come when God's glory will cover the whole earth. We see God's culmination, his breaking into the earth with this next passage. And before I start that, I think it's so important for us to recognize, and I'm not just speaking to this church, but to anyone who's listening, that God does break in to our history. He does break in when he wants and what he wills. He's not just this nebulous, universal being who cares nothing for his creation. He is always here, he always is with us, and we can count on him and trust in him. Amen. Let's look at Haggai, Old Testament. Haggai 2, 6 through 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Who is the glory of the latter temple? Who do we think it is, church? It's Jesus. Go to John 1, 14. And the word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we learn here that Jesus' name before he came to earth was the Word. Do you see how the Word became flesh? Look at John 1, 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. We read that his glory is full of grace and truth. It is a refiner's fire, making us pure, removing dirt and darkness to make us shine. It is also a wall of fire to surround you, his people. Zechariah 2.5 For I say the Lord will be a wall of fire all around her. That is speaking of Jerusalem, and I will be the glory in her midst. Just like God protected Israel from Pharaoh's soldiers with a wall of fire, he will protect you and his church. He loves you with an everlasting love. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. When we have Jesus, we have all things that are right and true. His glory purifies us and gives us peace. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, written hundreds of years before the coming of Messiah Jesus. Zechariah's name means Yahweh remembers. And he is one of the most messianic of all Old Testament prophets, giving distinct verifiable references to the coming Messiah. Zechariah 6, 12, behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Only when he rules shall all the evil of the world be cleansed away. When we make him our Lord, king over all, we get the king of peace and truth operating in us and through us. You are his living temple, church, and you have the power from him to overcome every temptation. Matthew 16, these are the words of Jesus, our Savior. This is verse 26 and 27. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. O oh, Jesus, help us to live according to your word in spirit and truth, showing others your light. What is awesome about this passage is Jesus speaks of him coming again with all his angels to reward those who follow him. He speaks of his coming in Matthew 24. Then the sign, verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hang in there, guys, hang in there. I'm I'm really almost done. We can see his glory, his power, truth, wonder, and majesty. Now I'd like to pray this over us all. Father, help us to live our life for all of you and experience the fullness of your glory in our lives, our families, and community. Let not one day go by without us thanking you and giving you praise. And the last thing I want to show you is a demonstration because this was shown to me in the spirit in the middle of the night. What happens when you enter his presence? Well, we know what we're going to do. But then what happens after that? This. 
the Lord says, come, yeah. come. I want to hold you. I want to embrace you. I want you with me always. Yeah. And so church, that's everything that we want is him. Amen. And so I want to pass it back to Pastor Maria. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs>